Welcome to our, uh, to our uh, panel. Um, we, when we crafted this uh, a few months ago, uh, there was a lot of discussion on uh, whether the third or the next golden age of television would ever happen in Germany, and I think we were all skeptical. Uh, at that moment in time, we decided to, uh, to uh, approach this subject from a positive angle. Instead of discussing why it never happens and why Germany is, is, is opting out, we decided to look at this differently and ask ourselves the question, could German drama series be the next export product for Germany? Um, well, a lot of things have happened over the last uh, few weeks, so we have to change the tone of voice uh, and actually turn this into a very promising, uh, uh, promising panel. Uh, with whom we're going to discuss this, uh, yeah, this exciting question of, uh, of German, uh, German drama production. Um, the Deutsche Zeitung in the, uh, this, this, this weekend even called it the Neue Deutsche Welle. So that seems like uh, there's a lot happening. Um, our panel question, like I said, is, uh, uh, is asking ourselves the question and the panel here, can a German series ever be an export product? And in the, uh, the article of Suddeutsche over the weekend, actually, they asked the same question, but they even took it one, one step further. And they asked the themselves, will all of a sudden Germany become Europe's primary place of, for series production? Mm -hmm. Before we go into that, let's first look at some facts that could prove this, uh, this thesis right. Um, some self-confident facts about Germany. Germany is the second largest export nation in the world only lacking uh, China by 500 trillion dollars. Germany is the sixth largest TV economy in the world and the second largest in, uh, in Europe. And German is the biggest European language with, uh, with over 100 million native speakers. Um, and also interesting, German is the third language on the, re on the ranking of most awarded Nobel Prizes by, uh, by language only, only trailing English and French by, and French by one nomination. If you put these statistics in the time capsule and you, uh, uh, you add the, teen, uh, the 10 DVDs of the best series of our days in the time capsule um, and an archaeologist in 1,000 years would find a time capsule, would he be surprised that none of these 10 series in the time capsule would be a German drama production? <coughs> the current situation... Uh, until recently then, is different. And uh, I would like to quote a tweet from, uh, from Thomas, um, who tweeted, I think, two months ago, Dear Television World, I have to apologize. You're celebrating the new golden age of television. I'm stuck with fake ranking shows. Best German <laughs> TV. And we all have the, 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 the possibility to ask Thomas how he feels about that right now. But despite that skepticism uh, that was around until recently, we at Fox International Channels, we believe that we live to tell great stories. And that also German series could and should have the power to attract, move and touch audiences. We find some proof of that belief uh, in the not so, uh, uh, not so long ago past. If we only go back to the early 80s, <coughs> and uh, uh, we find that German drama, drama series contained important elements that we currently uh, attribute to the third golden age of television, like innovations of the fourth dimension in the House of Cards, or the difficult man prot protagonists uh, and the, the somewhat edgier horizontal storylines. I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of belief. Democracy is so overrated. can't be trusted. The hunters become the hunted. Jäger oder Gejagter. The Walking Dead, the neue Staffel. First on Fox. So looking at this, uh, this great heritage of, uh, of only, what is it, 30 years ago, uh, we are happy to see that recently uh, TNT announced, uh, announced Weinberg, um, Sky, together with Beta Film, announced Berlin Babylon, uh, <laughs> Vox, Vox not, uh, not us, but the, the V in Vox, announced the Red Band Society German version, and UFA announced uh, uh, the production of, of Breaking News. 
Constantin film even announced on uh, in Cannes 12 horizontal German series. So a lot of things are happening and we are looking forward to discuss all these uh, these events with this uh, this great panel. Um, first and foremost uh, Gail and Hurt, executive producer of uh, The Walking Dead. Uh, not only a series but Variety called it very recently a, th a true cultural phenomenon in progress. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> then we have Gary Davy, Executive Vice President of, uh, of Content at Sky Germany. And uh, I'm, in my opinion, responsible for having us German appreciate better television. <laughs> Jan Morto, uh, Chairman of Beta Film. And uh, in the same article this weekend called Germany's Most Powerful Producer. And not only that, but also producer of the now Emmy, uh, Emmy Award nominated uh, German drama production Generation War. <laughs> next, to, uh, next to Jan, we have uh, Christiane Roof, uh, yeah, leading lady of German television production, who um, yeah, sometime started in television, uh, then moved, uh, moved over to film, being disappointed in television. Uh, and I only hope that her return to television is that swallow that heralds the upcoming spring. So, not, it's a big burden to carry. Um, and next to, uh, next to, sorry, yeah. <laughs> and next to uh, Christiane, we have Thomas Lukeraat, editor-in-chief editor and founder of David L, TV addict and conscious of German television. <laughs> so let's kick this off with a round of questions, starting with, uh, starting with Gail Ann. Um, besides being an avid diver, uh, a huge Arsenal fan, and the only one on the panel who has her uh, star on the uh, Walk of Fame on Hollywood Boulevard, um, yeah, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about what kind of question do I want to ask you is when, when your, the thing you produce is being called the cultural phenomenon in progress. Um, <coughs> How does that match with your first thoughts when you saw the, ser the series for the first time? Well, the interesting thing about Walking Dead is the number of networks that said no. Um, <laughs> every network except the new ones that have come online uh, and started broadcasting since uh, we started airing five years ago, um, every one of them said no. Uh, they weren't interested. And, and I do understand it because it seems like a very niche, not only a genre show, but a sub-genre show. Um, but the mistake, I think, was that the perception was that it was a show about zombies. Um, obviously, zombies are the threat. They're very important. Uh, the show takes place after there's been a zombie apocalypse, but it's about the characters. And I think that the, if you want to talk about the golden age of television, it's the golden age of character-driven storytelling. So, um, so but, but yes, it was, it was a huge surprise to all of us. We were hoping that we would get a couple of million viewers in the United States. Um, and the other thing that truly is remarkable and, and full credit to Fox International channels, from the time they read the first episode script, uh, they were on board. And, and that's also truly remarkable uh, that, that from the very beginning, Fox was on board with, uh, with AMC. Cool. Well, thanks for that, that compliment, of course. But what did, what did you think the first time you read the script? Well, I developed the script. So, yeah, so um, <laughs> yeah, but I hope that other people liked it. <laughs> Sorry, misdirected question in that sense. But I can, you're not writing alone. You're writing with a team of writers on it. So when yes. you start with an idea and then... Well, we started with a comic book. So that was the great thing. I mean, the, I think uh, with a comic book, you, you have the storyboards to a certain extent for the show. You have uh, the ability to bring the look, the feel, the, mm. the tone of the characters, which is very grounded. The characters in the comic book take what's going on for real. It's not campy. It's not silly. And, um, um, but, but never was there an expectation that the show would go on to become not only such a success in the United States, but such a success throughout the world. I mean, all we hoped was that it would be good 
and that we'd get a second season. Yeah. <laughs> Robert, uh, Robert Kirkman recently said that he now knows when he's going to bring the, the comic series to an end. Does it frighten you? No. 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 I mean, you know, the, he's already, um, you know, we're, we're only into our fifth season, and he's way ahead of us in terms of the comic books. He told me he has at least 250 issues figured out, so I think, I think we're fine. I mean, um, uh, I think there's always a natural ending to everything, including a comic book series, even The Simpsons, so. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Gail. Moving to, uh, to Gary. Um, I'm not sure if I can say it here, but last year on the Mira Awards, you claimed that Game of Thrones was your favorite series. You still want to stick to that, or did that no, change in the no, last... I no, I didn't say that. I said Game of Thrones was the greatest TV series ever made. I didn't say it was my favorite. Did I say it was my favorite? Yeah, yeah, you said. <laughs> I have too many favorite series now, uh, but Game of Thrones still stands out for me as being one of those extraordinary things that work so well in execution. I think if you could go way back to the pitch for Game of Thrones, you'd say, mm, okay, whatever. Um, but, you know, the difference between the pitch and the reality is obviously sometimes really quite true. My, my favourite HBO anecdote about story pitching is about The Sopranos because before HBO got the show, it was pitched to a, a bunch of other networks and one of which will remain unnamed but it r r rhymes with box. Um, apparently a big room full of <coughs> called experts got this pitch and they said, yeah, we like it, but, you know, does Tony Soprano really need to be in therapy? <laughs> Now, that would have completely destroyed the show, right, if yeah. you take that part of it out. So, I mean, it just keeps reminding me how little we all know about this business. Yeah. Well, that's a good lead into my next question uh, to you. Uh, sky success in Germany is, is beyond, uh, beyond doubt, uh, especially in the last, the last few years. I think Sky has proven that there's, yeah, there's a big demand for watching better television. But if you read the articles, it's most of all contributed to its... Uh, to its uh, clever technology strategy, uh, HD, Sky Go, and premium sports. In your opinion, what role did series, or do series play in Sky's uh, success? I, I think a critical role. I, I think we were very lucky on timing. I think two things happened at the same time. We developed a technology agenda mm -hmm. that matched where technology was going. We, we, uh, Julia reminded me this morning that we launched Sky Go before there was a thing called an iPad. So we were already into that mobility thing way before then. So we, we got very aggressively involved in the whole mobility on-demand proposition. And then along came this whole new generation of high-quality series. And the, the two combined, I think, opened a conversation with a completely new generation of television consumers. It's a younger, tech-savvy, lean-forward, smart, affluent, upmarket kind of... That's an oversimplification, but it's a really distinct group who want this series of a particular type. They want it now, so they've got to watch it day and date with the US, and they like it on demand. So I think there was a combination of, of this, this, the kind of series that were, were being made match the technology perfectly to suit the lifestyle of that young tech-savvy generation. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Moving to, uh, to Jan, um, uh, you were mentioned in uh, the Deutsche the mo as, as uh, the most powerful producer in Germany. Uh, your name appears in almost every announcement of the last few weeks on all the great series that we are uh, announcing. What is happening in Germany? Uh, people are finally mm, discovering how important I am. <laughs> it took me 32 years <laughs> to get there. Um, I think it's, uh, yeah, not in every important announcement, but the point is, I would say it's logical. I mean, the fact, not that I am famous or important, but um, that uh, my name or name of my company is associated with projects which try to become what we call international television. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's logical because it has been what we have been trying to achieve in last years and to bring it back 
Germany, um, Germany has all the elements which are necessary uh, today to produce television, which, you know, television series, if we limit to that, which can compete internationally. Um, so you just have to recognize the potential of something and to put or to bring the right elements together. And this is not a big wisdom or it's not a magic. Mm -hmm. It's perhaps experience, it's knowing the people, it's knowing we are still, I mean, projects are fairy tale castles at the beginning. So we, it's the ability to recognize something which uh, has the potential to bring the right people together, to get the financing together, and yeah, to be lucky at the end. Yeah. Uh, but I really believe that Germany, and I have been trying to repeat it as often as I could, uh, has a potential, and Germany is not using this potential yet for different reasons. Yeah. You also, and I think the words were put in your mouth uh, in, in the article, um, but I, actually I hope you said it, because it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting, interesting statement. Um, but for the matter of fact, you implicitly said a lot of the recent developments uh, have to do with the ego of German producers. If you said it, what did you mean? Yes, I said it, but I said it in a different context as it has been reported. So if I can use the platform here and to ask all my colleagues, producers I'm working with to not to be offended, <laughs> what I meant was the following, the driving force behind this development are not as much the networks in Germany, um, the energies coming from producers who suddenly, because of the development, because are interested to play in this international game. I mean, we are all national in our production and so far and so on, but we have this second level of reality in we work and think and develop, which is international. And combining those two is interesting. It opens you new markets and so on and so on. So I can, and producers want to be part of that. I mean, they want to be successful not only in Germany, but uh, also elsewhere. And we brought some producers or we invite producers to the markets. And it's interesting to see how they react and how they are like children when they suddenly realize that their shows are being seen somewhere they never thought they would be seen and so far and so on. So it's the contact or confrontation with a bigger market than the German market, is, besides all the economic questions and so far and so on. There is one issue which I would like to raise here. I am surprised that Germany being second largest exporting country in the world, this is what you said yeah. at the beginning, yeah, and sixth biggest television market, doesn't have, uh, did not understand the importance of of, um, cultural industry being exported. For a nation which is selling cars and whatever, uh, the fact uh, that people watch shows coming from this country is also a kind of marketing instrument. We could get deeper into that. The French understood that. They do not have such a good cars as the German have. Uh, <laughs> and this is what I Surprised. I mean, we have uh, in the feature film area, we feel for the first time that politics starts interest in being interested in that. It's not the case for television. And second issue, German television executive, uh, executives, and Gary, please forgive me, I do not mean you, obviously, only the others. Uh, they do not care or did not care about success or not success of their shows outside of their country, which is logical because they have to take care of their audiences and so far and so on. But uh, it would not exclude also this aspect. So there are many things which are changing and many things have to change. Thank you. Christian, uh, uh, Jan also uh, just said that producers are a big energy driver current of the current developments. You've been very outspoken in the, in, in, yeah, in the past months also on the role of producers and the role of networks in the, uh, in the German developments. How do you feel about it right now? 
Uh, well, I think my, my attitude hasn't changed so much because I, I see the wave, I see what everybody's calling now the golden age. I've been at the MIP market and I see a tremendous uh, suddenly offer of all series which should go in production or are discussed, whatever. But still, I see also a situation where coming of the last jury at the uh, television awards recently, we really had problems as a jury to identify even three top German series, which weren't series which we prized already over the last few years. So it still means, I think, German television has to prove that we are able to create successes, and what I mean with successes, especially long-running successes. Um, I, I find it tremendously difficult still to have the partnerships with the network where the network understands my enthusiasm as a producer, and I'm always very <coughs> stubborn, so if I am in love with one of my developments, that's the way I want to do it, and that's the way I want to see the show. And you need, you need the network as a partner, and I loved it when the HBO guy said, you know, we hire somebody we trust, and then trust them, because this is really something I very often miss in Germany with the networks here, because we have an editor's uh, 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 programming, uh, people from the networks who tend to tell how they want to see a show, not so much trusting the producers, not so much trusting the creatives, and that is a missing link I really, really find uh, hard, and it has to be overcome, because otherwise, I think for any German series, whether it's exported or not, it can be difficult in the future to sustain on a long-running business. And the networks have to trust and have to let shows on the air. That's the other issue. Not always pulling them off after six episodes or sometimes even two episodes because a show can never prove if it's going to develop or not. And that's short-sighted, I think. Well, I think the left of the audience is, is on your side with, uh, with this. So Only we, the left side. Uh, we get, no, but left it's, is okay. It, it's, it's good. We... Uh, we're going, to, we're going to go into a discussion later, so that's, that's good to know. Thomas. Well, that uh, was the point that we had finally the enemy, network, <laughs> network people. So we all, ag uh, we all agree this is the enemy, right? I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm the moderator <laughs> in this. Uh, in this uh, going over to Thomas. Thomas, uh, your, your other quote on uh, television we we're already saw. You, you, you also uh, had another uh, tweet uh, uh, recently, which, uh, which I find, yeah, as, as Fox and... Our, our motto is first on Fox, quite intriguing. When you said the quality of German, German television w will not be measured by the question how quickly you show US series, but will be measured by the quality of the German series you, uh, you put on screen. Those two tweets in mind, um, how do you feel about the state of German television as of now? Much better than a year ago, actually. Um, my, the tweet you just, um, you just mentioned, I did last year in December when Z1, due to bad ratings for House of Cards, decided to air the remaining sh uh, episodes of House of Cards in one night. And a friend of mine on Facebook posted, see, that's again a sign why German television isn't so good. And I was thinking, why, we can't really measure the quality of German television by judging how fast they can show American television series. I mean, I love American television series, that's not the point. But we need German shows. I mean, it can't yes. be the case that I'm talking to uh, Wolfgang Link from Proceedings at Eins, and the whole Proceedings at Eins is not announcing a single new series for the next season, not a single fictional programming series for the next season. That's, I mean, that's, you can't really talk about waves. I mean, you can, you can sit there and still um, expect that television business is coming in waves and you're just sitting there and waiting till the reality part of the casting shows are coming back up. But I think we need more German drama and the last couple of weeks, the MIP and all the announcements ahead, they, I mean, you, you, you expect something from German television now. There are several projects you, you expect something of and that's what something, I mean, in the last years it was hard to expect something from German television. Um. You're a TV addict. Do you think German stories stand any chance outside of Germany? Stand any chance in the world? Well, I mean, we have Scandinavian shows, we have French shows, we have uh, Spanish shows which are traveling around the world. I mean, in Great Britain you have Danish TV shows just with subtitles. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't see a point why German television shows shouldn't travel around the world. It's not so long a one-way street anymore. 
Yeah, I think we should not try uh, to give the impression that we are inventing something or the world. German television series have been very successful for years and years, and they still are. So the discussion which we perhaps should go into is more, it's not a quantity discussion. It's also not about how much Germany produce, is producing or not, because this is a production country still. But the point is, what is a kind of television which we believe can be successful here? in Germany, and I definitely mean that there is, that we have been, that we kept for quite a long time successes on screen, which well, and which prevented innovation, in a way, yeah? So we have, uh, this has to do with the public of the two uh, big public broadcasters who are the biggest, and so far, and so there are many reasons for that. So the issue is, uh, can, a new kind of shows, or this uh, character-driven, or whatever, we, however we describe it, uh, come from Germany, out of the situation where still two main forces in the market decide about what is going uh, to be produced or not in, uh, in fiction are the two public uh, networks mm -hmm. with a very specific audience. So I think we need, unless you start producing on a large uh, scale, which we would hope. So innovation in other countries also didn't come from the traditional television, it came from pay, as we know, and so forth and so on. If you look at France, which has been the most traditional market in TV production, just uh, to talk about a neighbor. And suddenly, when France, which had quota, as you know, has been protecting their national production and so forth and so on, and for someone like us who is selling to the world what the world does neither need nor want, uh, and it's always difficult, French was impossible to sell anything out of France. It has changed because the country has opened suddenly through the technology, through the technology and people started competing, or the national system started competing with the international quality. And this is what is happening also in Germany. So we have very strong national, traditional, whatever series you know, which have been successful outside. And for the first time, we have now knowledge, which obviously was created, or we have a situation where press contributed to that. So we have to do something new because this is boring and nobody is watching and so forth and so on. And the question is, uh, will we be able to do that? And I think the next two years will show, and I very much hope, that we will. I, I think to, to Christian's point about the, 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 there's a big issue around the, the whole courage thing about, you know, going from an era where we're producing a pilot or maybe a, a two or three episode commitment to, to take the big leap into a ten episode commitment. That's that's really where you need to get a production industry too so that you've got continuity and confidence to, to build a show. But, but even the U US, that's a relatively new trend, right? Gail, you... Uh, well, I don't believe that uh, The Walking Dead would have gone to six episodes if Fox International mm -hmm. had not gotten involved and said, that's the model that works for us. Um, it's still very much a pilot-driven business. And the thing, and I think, I mean, <laughs> there are, in my opinion still, and this is why let me have the more skeptical position today, despite the fact that I love produce and I will definitely, but the thing is we have to overcome a lot of obstacles and still one issue in Germany is that we compare apples to peers because everybody looks at the American TV, obviously, and everybody loves it. And I was teaching recently the semester in Ludwigsburg, renowned university, the serious production. And these kids there, all in their early to late 20s, no idea about German fiction whatsoever. They don't watch it, they don't like it, they're not interested. So basically, I was sitting with them and showing one series, one pilot, one thing after the other. And honestly, it was not a very good reception from their side because they are fed and raised on Mad Men, Walking Dead and you know game of thrones and all these shows so i said to them guys you will be the future people i don't see you working in hollywood i see you working in germany so what can you do without you know without wanting to be the bad 
here to give you the truth, but this at the end of the day is one obstacle, how we get the new guys coming in the industry with their own fresh idea for a German market coming from their perspective. Basically all networks, including Pro7, I heard their latest numbers, lost the young audience. The, even their audience on most evenings is 40 plus, I thought they were younger, and with the other networks they're between 50, 51 and 60 something. So that's something else. So then we have to look at the budgets. The budget in the States for any given drama series is two, three, four, and plus million dollars an episode. If we produce for the German market, we talk somewhere between 400 and maybe 600,000 an hour, which is really a big difference. And if the networks are not willing to support the producers in a way that we are willing and able to work with writing rooms, which at Sony, where I was before for a long time, I did over 13 years, well, it costed us a lot of money, but foresighted it was because these shows are still sold again and again in second, third and fourth cycles even in Germany. So I mean there is a lot of thinking and renovating not only from the content side but generally in terms of uh, financing, ideas, you know, training the new generation. It's a lot of issues and this is why I love the wave but still somebody has to ride it. It's, it's a big issue. Maybe, maybe going a bit to, back to the US, uh, because we're, we're trying to, to see now what current trends are happening in Germany. Gail, if you look back in the US, like 10, 20 years ago, what, what do you think or what do you see as the main drivers bringing the US television market to the point where it currently is producing? Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting because I think that features in the US have switched places with television. Oftentimes, certainly when I was growing up, um, as I like to say, in antediluvian times, um, you went to see films because there were the most character-driven stories in feature films. Um, and on television, you had, you know, you had uh, essentially a lot of procedural shows. You had soap operas. Um, but you didn't have really complex characters and compelling storytelling um, that took risks. Now you see that U.S. feature films are sequels and remakes. Not that there's anything wrong with those. Heaven knows I've made them myself. But the studios are now very fear-based, the ones that are making feature films. So they want to make something with the least amount of risk, something that they call pre-sold, pre-sold ideas, so that's essentially regurgitated ideas. Um, and audience actually is smarter than that, they're de more demanding than that, um, and they're now getting that kind of storytelling from video games, uh, very common video games uh, with interesting characters, and they're getting it in television. So I think th it's been a complete to serialize storytelling in which um, in the past the, the networks were afraid and I think that all of this is due to the ability to stream, the ability to catch up on serialized storytelling because um, you know in the past that was the fear that if you missed an episode there was no way to see it if you didn't watch it on the night that it aired. Um, and I can understand that fear. Now we don't have that problem, and, and I think that um, um, that's why you certainly see the cable networks taking a lot more risks. Um, and certainly with, with AMC, we have marathons when you can catch up. We air uh, on, the, on the Sunday night before the new episode airs, we, episode, we, we air last week's episode. So you, you're never far behind in catching up. There's Netflix, there's iTunes, even um, AMC often streams uh, the, the season premiere. So there's no concern about, about falling behind and not being able to keep up with the story. So I think that's, that's been the shift. If we, um, if we look at Germany at this moment, uh, and I think Jan, you already uh, uh, hinted on that, the, yeah, the role of the, of the public broadcasters. I think one of the special elements here, and I, I would like to talk a bit about that on, uh, with Berlin uh, Babylon, where there's a very exciting announcement that actually it's the first private-public cooperation in, in television, where 
a huge series uh, uh, is produced by Sky together with uh, uh, with ARD. Um, and Beta. Yeah, and and Beta, of course. Sorry, sorry, Jan. Thanks for bringing that up. Where I think that's a different model in the U.S., where the monetization takes place on one network only. Uh, and is then monetized over export and asphalt. Uh, is this model with the public-private corporation, is that going to stick for Germany or...? Quite possibly. I mean, w w the backstory to this is quite interesting because we were pitched the idea, I guess, two years ago. We love the idea. It, it's, uh, I mean, visually it's just intriguing idea of Berlin in, in, the 19, in 1929. So I always, visually, it, to me, it's like a cross between Boardwalk Empire and Cabaret. So visually, it's a very exciting thing, combined with a wonderful story with in intriguing characters and a long story arc. So it had all the elements <coughs> we're looking for, but it was way beyond our reach in terms of the scale of the commitment. Um, the show was also pitched to ARD at the same time. And purely by coincidence, we and ARD found ourselves in an interesting conversation that said, well, is there some formula where we could do this show together? Um, and I have to say, I was very sceptical when the conversation started. But we very quickly came to an agreement because I think we both saw that this was a really great opportunity and it had enormous potential to move the whole conversation further. And Jan, who is very famous for making big risky bets on these things, was there to support the whole project due to international. And I should say, Jan recently did something else quite extraordinary with a, a production called Gamora. Anybody gets to see Gamora, I think that's taken television to a whole new level. Now that's a show shot in the back streets of Naples, literally in Gamora country. It's a brilliantly gritty very Italian story, but I think it's a, an enormously important TV show. And Jan was a very early investor. He beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, so, but in order to, to have a clear windowing strategy for ARD and for Sky, we need to stick to a very strong distinction in Germany between free and pay TV television. I think where you see the, the, the lines between cable and networks in the US, you see it blurring. Um, yeah, any opinions from the German part of the panel? How important are this virtual reality of free TV and pay TV for us? I, I think as, as a producer, um, I think we love the idea that uh, pay TV is, is coming in as a real new client for a possible client for all of us. And as we see from our first conversations we had, that's a different approach, that's a much more open approach. That's a more kind of, yes, we trust you as creative guys approach. And even if the financing is more an issue I have to get into, which I haven't had so far with the other networks, I think we are totally willing to do that and to take that because we see possibilities we don't have with the other networks. So yes, please, do more, order more, give us a chance to come to you guys and let us do and play and, and create successes together yeah. in for the uh, with German series for pay TV, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's interesting to see uh, somebody like uh, Bernd Reichert at Vox who said that uh, he thinks that the private channels of the second gen generation, they, are, they should do a fictional series, they should do drama series. I mean, we were for years just looking at the public broadcasters at, R well, at RTL or Z1, maybe Pro7, but I mean, the success in the US came from the cable channels. So they didn't had, uh, they didn't had to do like 10 million viewers with the first episode, even though, I mean, Walking Dead is now the most successful American TV series. Coming from a cable network, Breaking Bad started with a 1.5 million viewers and even dropped below a million viewers. So compared to the smaller German TV market, it wouldn't be in success at, at ZDF Neo even. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, when we think about new shows, we have the blockbusters, we have the big developments coming from public broadcasters or the cooperation between public broadcasters and Sky or maybe RTL. But the small ideas, which we all find fascinating in all the small cable channels or even on the online platforms nowadays, they should come from small channels in Germany as well. I mean, why was there... Yeah. I mean, why, what, was there a reason we didn't really... 
asked the small channels, why don't you do drama series? I mean, I did interviews with all the CEOs of the small channels for the last 13 years, and it was like a no-go question to even ask, why don't you do a drama series? And this is coming down. I mean, we see opening up the whole thing about TV series, drama producing, so that's a really, really good thing. I was never so hopeful about the German TV market than I was in this year. Yeah. But all sorry. So the smaller uh, uh, free TV channels or the, uh, are still mainly or dominantly animals funded, so they have to deliver ratings, they have to deliver all the... Smaller. I mean, they don't need to get like five million viewers. It's happy with two. Yeah, but no, they still have to, have to go for ratings. And the point I... The, the question I wanted to ask you is, uh, because that was also brought forward in some, uh, some uh, views on the of the last week, if the first series are being produced and they don't bring the ratings that are enough to finance those series, will this, this trend end as quickly as it, as it emerged? How do you see that? Yes. Yes, I see it. Honestly, mm. I see it. Uh, because, I mean, for example, with Vox, because we had some discussions at the market as well, and they do now Red Band Society, mm. and I think one trigger for Bernd Reicher to do that was the fact that he, there is a sh series they could look at, they do the script, the adaptation, and they have from Spain the ratings and everything concerning the show. So it's, uh, he can do it in a very short time. I think it's like in eight months, you know, from having the idea to, to shoot it to whatever. Normally it lasts much longer to produce, to develop a show. I mean, def definitely did always in the past. And, but if it doesn't work, they don't see their primary business in doing German fiction at Vox. Mm -hmm. And I think the other discussions we had with ZDF Neo, for example, because now they're tapping into series production, which I find very interesting and very compelling because they are a network, they have other issues, and the ratings, they are an issue, but not as crazy as with other networks. But then there you have definitely a money issue. And now I know what they pay for half hour because they do half hour sitcom as well as half hour drama, which is a totally new kind of format. And uh, then you have to say, okay, as a production company or as a producer, can I be in this business for that amount of money I have for that time slot? Which is very, very stretching and very compelling. Do you know what's actually very interesting? Um, outside of sports programming, does anyone know what the second highest rated show is on Sunday nights in America? It's actually a one hour show in which panelists sit on a sofa and discuss what just happened on The Walking Dead. It's called The Talking Dead. <laughs> and I mean, it, it sounds silly, but, but think about that. I mean, it, it averages about seven million viewers. Wow. So that, that's a considerable number of, of viewers. Yes. And they're able, exactly. <laughs> so it costs almost nothing, and because of the ratings, AMC is able to demand quite a lot in, in ad sales. Um, but it, but it's, just, it's interesting because I, I have to say, AMC thought outside the box. You should have read what the media pundits and the other networks said when they originally announced they were doing a show where people were gonna sit around and talk about what they'd just seen on television. I mean, they were called fools, they were called they've gone too far now, you know. Now everyone's doing it. Everyone is emulating. Um, FX, you know, had a has a uh, after show um, on Sons of Anarchy. There's a show on uh, Teen Wolf. All of the shows that have a very engaged younger audience that otherwise would be talking about it amongst themselves on social media, which they still do, are now glued to the TV for another hour. Uh, yeah, the, the debate about ratings, I think, is really interesting because in our space, in a TV space, ratings play a very small part in our decision making. Certainly, a very small part in the decision making leading up to a project. Um, and even after that, for example, this year, if we, if I'd measured the success of uh, True Detective by the ratings, I mean, it was a disaster. But from a brand perception point of view, it was a huge success. And, and at HBO, for example, you know, they, 80% of their ratings are to movies. And yet 99% of their brand image is related to their series. 
And as we all know, they spend an enormous amount of money on series, but they do it not for ratings, they do it for the brand image. So we, we would measure the stickiness of a show not by the ratings, but by people's perceived value of the show. That's why cable pay TV companies do have the courage to say, we're going to take 10 episodes of this thing, we're going to stick by it, we're going to plan it well, we're going to promote it, we're going to market it well, and we're not going to pull it after two episodes. And because it takes two or three episodes for the viewers to find the characters and to find the story. So we are not really driven by ratings, and that, what that's led to is a different kind of storytelling. Like networks that need big audiences are kind of stuck in this procedural structure. They kind of have to because that's what the ratings dictate. We're in a different space. That's why we like this long story arcs. And this ex one sentence. There was interesting another discussion last week at Cannes that the Americans now all in their you know uh, uh, ongoing story way of telling, they don't fit the German needs anymore with the networks who want to buy series. I mean, that was like RTL said one pro seven. They go to the main screenings and they have problems to identify their classical procedural drama. And now the German producers, we all start thinking like the Americans, you know, with ongoing shows and mm. not procedural anymore. And this is a kind of scissor, which is, again, an interesting way of opening and not coming really together, what the needs are for some networks and what everybody now tries to do. Thank you. Uh, on the other hand, may I? Uh, quick last Zedev, remark. Zedev is uh, opening two time slots a year, two times six hours to try something different. Not 12 hours, six hours. So they are moving a little bit. That's true, there are not time slots available. There is no time slot for 12 hour series you know, on German television. I mean, just imagine, ARD, uh, how? I mean, unless you go into the traditional Tuesday night thing where they expect other things. Mm -hmm. So many, many things have to change. But still, I believe they are changing. So there is a movement, and this is not in order to be optimistic here and to preach whatever, but the situation is changing. Every single element which we need to have together and any financing, creativity, and whatever international market, it's coming together. So those will be very interesting two years. And, back to, and back to the question about can Germany, Germany, Germany export programming? <laughs> I think one of the most extraordinary things I've seen here is how successfully ZDF created an appetite for Scandi crime series on, on a night. It's an extraordinary phenomenon. I mean, if, if the German population can accept Danish, I can't imagine why the rest of the world can't accept German. And, yeah. and by the way, Orange is Black is just Women Behind Bars, which was originally a German mm. series, wasn't it? Yes, it was. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So, so we're running towards the end of our time slot, so that's why I wanted to ask one final question on the export market to, to Gil, and then I want to open up for Q&A uh, uh, from the audience. Um, what intrigues me, because I'm far away from the creative process, but if you're in part of the creative unit, do you think about the export, exportability of, of a franchise, of a series? Well, I, honestly, I think the most important thing is to make sure that you make a, the best possible version of your series, not everything is going to be exported. Um, and the minute you start second guessing yourself, will this play in Germany, will this play in you know, South America, you're making a less good product. Thank you. So um, last five minutes, um, questions from the audience to the experts in the panel. Gentlemen up front. All right. Um, I find it interesting how Christiana pointed out that German producers only have like uh, a small fraction of uh, the budget that U.S. producers have for their shows, and I think based on that, it's pretty sure to assume that uh, major German broadcasters, um, well, they are more likely to to buy another season of Two and a Half Men or something than produce those big shows because. Um, well, they get like the similar ratings, but um, there are like new ways to um, move like, for instance, um, in the US to produce a movie and turn it into a TV show, like HBO is about to do with, um, I guess, uh, what was the show, uh, Shutter Island? 
or the Amazon model where they test pilots online before they go into production. So what of those developments do you think are most promising for German producers that want to produce a show and take it to the US or global? So Gil, any US perspective on that question? How do you see those developments by Amazon piloting series online? Is, is, how, is it important well, for you? you know, they're, they're still spending a great deal of money on the pilot. Um, and I, I don't know what the percentages are of the ones that they actually pick up to go to series. Um, it, uh, and, and I don't even know how many people are actually viewing the, the shows on, on Amazon. Um, but I, I do think that, I, I believe, you know, go bold. Um, and, and one thing we were talking about actually outside was the difference in the U.S. and much of Europe is that we have an entire writer's room. Yes. I think that's an important thing to think about, is that allows you, I mean, it's how we're able to make 16 episodes of The Walking Dead instead of six, because we have an entire room of writers working together, breaking the stories and writing scripts so that the writer can be on set, both to prep their episode and to oversee it during, um, during the shooting, and, uh, and then to come back and supervised post-production. And I think that might, I mean, I know it's expensive, but once you know that you're going forward with something, um, I think it's a value for the U.S. to embrace. And uh, the one thing which I mentioned are that coming from a situation so many numbers, when we network for a half hour show, 12 and a half thousand euros for one script, the average script for our sitcoms was 35,000 per half hour. So we deficited every script round about 20,000 euros. Why did we do it? Because at that time we kept all the rights to our shows. And this was fabulous. So Sony was willing to deficit on the scripts. And this is why we had a writing room. We basically worked with 22 writers all over, which enabled us to do five shows a year with 13 episodes each show, 65 scripts. Today, not possible anymore because the rights are with the networks so far and the writing rooms in that case don't exist anymore. So you have to pay the writer what you get from the network and that's it. And I think that's another thing. The right situation has to change drastically because if the studios own the rights to a certain extent, then deficit financing is an issue I would take on any time, any time, if I have the chance and later on to get the ancillary rights and, you know, sell the show, whatever. But this is, again, something the networks have to play with and hopefully will again more in the future because then you are able, as a production company, as a producer, to have writing rooms, to establish a system System, which unfortunately we had at one point, which I don't see so much at the moment anymore, besides the soaps maybe. Thank Thanks. you. Any other question? I get the signal that we have to close off. Uh, so then maybe one closing question for the panel here. Um, what do we think about the future? Is it good? Moderate? I would say good as long as it, it lasts. I mean, as Christiana said, maybe when the f first uh, shows are airing, see how they're going. Let's hope it sticks. Let's hope the, the optimism is, is staying because I was reminded of the panel before. Fritz von Thun, the actor, he just said, he was talking about television in the early days without ratings. And he said, <laughs> when we didn't have ratings, we just did whatever we wanted and it was exciting. And this is kind of the same thing with all the Amazons and Netflix nowadays because nobody can really measure the success. And let's just hope that the optimism and this, this golden age will stay for a while. I wouldn't rate in good or bad. I would say definitely interesting challenging and at the end of the day something good will come out something good will come out and i'm an eternal optimist so i totally believe in that but it will be also a hard work on the way to ride the wave so let's be all golden surfers that's the best we can do yeah gary do you want to be optimistic as you'd expect but we are on the wheels you know we're at the beginning of a, a long journey but it's going to be exciting all right. Then, uh, before I'm being kicked off the, the stage, uh, I would like to thank... Can, can I send something to the future? Yes. <laughs> or about the future? I think that the Germany or German television industry has a great future. 
this is, I'm honest about it. This is the reason why I started 10 years ago my company and I think we are the beginning of something which will be a fascinating development here. And we can talk about that in three years here. You invite me. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gil. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Christiane. Thanks, Thomas.